We should. All right, so I'm going to... Maybe introductions too. Yeah. So hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our morning panel. We totally didn't realize it was 10 minutes in, because um, we were still trying out tech. Technical details, yeah, we're still not fully set up, so... Um, but yeah, anyway, I am Chris Totten. I am the game artist in residence at American University. I'm also the head of the local IGDA chapter, International Game Developers Association, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Josh McCoy from American University, Assistant Professor of Computer Science in the Game Lab. Uh, I research in artificial intelligence by the video games, particularly in uh, particularly implementing some humanities concepts such as social interaction inside video games. Uh, fame to fame, and we'll probably talk about this uh, at a uh, game called Prom Week in the IGF along with uh, a team of people from UC Santa Cruz. So it was, uh, it was a good time. Very, very much related to this panel. I'm trying to get to it. So we're going to talk about persuasive games in this panel. Um, now, persuasive games are typically understood as games that use the language of interactive media uh, in some form to, you know, help people form an opinion, to make an argument for a certain point of view, to explore previous events, to explore current events, um, you know, to have people interact with some sort of system that allows, uh, you know, that addresses some real world purpose but through a game-like interface. So you might hear the term uh, serious games a lot. You know, serious games have been, uh, you know, people say serious games are kind of like persuasive games too. Some people say serious games and persuasive games are different because serious games have become associated with training simulations and things like that. There's a whole murky world of, of these terms out there. Um, so we're going to guide you guys through who so kindly joined us uh, MAGFest early in the morning on Saturday after what was probably a big night of partying. Um, you know, through this world of, of persuasive games. How are they made? Why are they made? Um, and how how do we make them, or, you know, how can you make them, uh, you know, fun, really? I mean, that's, that's the trick is, you know, how do these games not become preachy? How do they become actual? Yeah, so the persuasive is the, the, the key word here. Uh, really, as Chris described, getting the point of the game across in a way that could possibly change how someone sees that issue in the future or that mechanic, that, that space. So it's, it's a pretty wide open uh, field right now. And, and you know, persuasion can be anywhere from uh, you know having a, a game like uh, like nine twelve. Um, which uh, is sort of one of the, the first uh, news games where, uh, where sort of the day after 9-11 you have to be able to cross hairs that you would fire down to make terrorists and uh, the, the interactions you have in this world are complicated. It was showing that you know, through military intervention you solve some problems but create many more. The, it, so the game he's talking about is uh, September 12th. Uh, basically, like he said, you're crosshair and you're, you're trying to kill terrorists in a village. So you fire your missile at the terrorists, and but you will inevitably hit civilians. And when you hit civilians, other civilians will come, cry over the burning pole, and then turn into terrorists. So it's just, yeah. And and going deeper in the description. Well, and what is interesting about this game is that you can't win it, um, and that's kind of the point. Is that you know that's one example of of game rhetoric, as we say, is the rhetoric of you know, unwinnable games. So you can use, you know, that when we say the language of games, we think of, you know, verbs. So game verbs, games are about doing. So, uh, you know, Mario jumps, Link explores, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you turn those verbs into something that supports um, a point you're trying to make? And then, you know, uh, resources to manage, win-loss conditions, goals, you know, September 12th has the goal of try to kill all terrorists, and it has therefore an implied win condition, but that's the trick, is that you can't actually uh, reach the win condition, and thus it makes its argument. Um, I'm going to think of some other good persuasive games, I know a bunch, but... Well, yeah, so it's going to go through the, the... So that was more of the news game style of persuasive games. Uh, you have issues, uh, games about issues, 
Uh, I'm thinking more of like what's happened recently in the independent game world with uh, with uh, uh, transgender issues, how dogs, dysphoria, uh, the twine memes that have been popular recently and that are really cool. I have been checking them out. So you have sort of like these advocacy games persuading people to be more open about a, a, a topic. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, games that are about um, uh, education. Those are also persuasive games. You are uh, imparting knowledge onto a student and hoping that they will be in, and so in a way that they will absorb through game mechanics. Uh, and we have a, an artifact we can show on this, maybe if we have internet. Uh, uh, we were at White House Game Jam last weekend, and the Game Jam was all about making education games. So there's a, a nice new fresh set of, of these out in the world now. Uh, so, okay, we have it. So this is yeah, a, a yeah, game yeah, about yeah. Uh, about teaching students transformational functions. Linear functions, sine functions, quadratic functions, things that can be graphed. We want to show the relationship between the coefficients of those terms to what the graph output is. So we'll just watch the trailer real quick. Was this created at the game jam? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the final deliverable of the game jam is actually the trailer. So if you see, there are different function types to the left. Here's an equation where you change the slider to change the coefficients on various terms in the equation. So here's a quadratic function. You can see changing the sliders changes the arc of the, of the laser, the weapon. And that's so you can hit, so you can solve puzzles. There's the linear weapon, that one's really fun. Yep. The linear weapon is great with enemies because you're basically just like, get down! Yeah. So here's a bit of problem solving with the sine laser. This is my favorite laser. So you can adjust the frequency and amplitude by adjusting the coefficients. What's great here is there's a tight binding between what's happening on the screen, the dynamics of how the laser moves, and the actual changing of coefficients you get. So you can see these change in real time for spawning how the, the graft function, aka the laser, changes on the screen. So that's also in the wheelhouse of the two games, these, these educational games. Yep. Uh, and so if we look back, though, you know, and, and I talk about games as rhetorical things. Um, so <clears throat> if, if we look at this, we have a classic game problem. You know, this is one of our bosses, and it's sort of this, like, you know, destroy the Death Star core kind of thing. Um, but in this, you know, this is where we go from just trying to teach you math to, okay, so let's teach you math but as a game designer. Uh, this is a very simple implementation of it where we say, all right, what is the sign laser? What does it do? What makes it interesting? Um, so let's level design around this. So we designed, you know, for the purpose of the video, we just designed this simple uh, construction here of three walls and you have to use the sign laser to get through them. But conceivably, you could then say, okay, well, what's the next iteration of that? You know, we've talked about having it so that, you know, these walls will start to maybe accordion this way a little bit. So you now, now you have to play with the amplitude in different ways uh, to get it to constantly be firing. Because, you know, maybe we say in a future build, you know, you have to fire steadily on it for so long to get hits or something like that. Same thing, we can have them accordion in this way, and then you have to change the frequency of it. So, you know, you take this idea of, like, here's our core mechanic is, we want you to transform sine functions by changing the coefficients, and then we can build game problems around you having to do that. Same thing with the quadratic laser. Um, you get a little sense of what it does here, with you know having to have it sort of reach under you know like you're trying to pull a candy bar out of a vending machine or something but you know again the non like after game jam uh versions of this game because that's the thing of game jam we're always like oh well we did this in 48 hours but we should probably keep working on this um i've been pushing for the quadratic thing to be a, almost like a i call it the fishing laser 
Exactly. So you can have like a deep hole and you have to use the quadratic function to reach into the hole or vice versa to reach up. Um, so, you know, this one could have been solved with a linear laser, but really it could have been solved with anything. But, you know, it's about trying to figure out how you present gamers with these problems that they are pretty familiar with, but you have to use these persuasive, um, you know, verbs and actions to, to make them, you know, engage the artists. So, let's also bring up, while well, we have internet and while it's not failing us. Right here. Uh, last one, or there's one in concrete we don't have to log into. It's like a, the, almost the last one. We have to sit through an ad. Otherwise, you have to log into Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want everybody seeing your feed on the screen. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Windows 8, what are you doing? Yes, it's in the yeah, so uh, okay, it's getting the three fingers to loot. Uh, Prom Week is a game that real that through deep play, through act, through making a space that wasn't playable before, uh, playable now. It lets you more deeply understand in a systems way what's going on in this particular area. While it's loading, I have a question. Yeah. How would you differentiate these types of games <clears throat> from games that attempt to do the same thing but you don't think do as good a job? I mean, how do you evaluate how good a job of persuading it actually does? Right, so that is an open academic question. Uh, actually, judging the efficacy of persuasion through people interacting with you know, these virtual artifacts, through digital artifacts, uh, is uh, still an art being solved. Yeah. Uh, you now you see now we have some broad metrics like how many people play this and talk about it afterwards in ways that are akin to the problem they're going to solve. Did they get the frame? Did they get the point? Uh, that's a very soft way. Uh, sometimes people use surveys, post-interview uh, questionnaires, actual interviews, uh, your standard IRB-approved academic stuff. People use, and that's it's still out there whether people actually do it or not. And another way is seeing how they interact with the game. So if you have a standard like game difficulty progression that relies on the players learning how to play the game, learning the point of the game, learning the rhetoric of the game to progress through the game, you you know you get a sense of how much they probably know from level one progressing through the mechanics to level ten. Uh, and by virtue that they can play at the skill level of level ten you know that they must know something about the game. That is, that is an assumption. That is one unproven way that, it, that you will see uh, a soft metric being used. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so Prom Week is a game about playing the social lives of these high school characters. Uh, actually, if you can, uh, like story mode, I think is a, a better place to, to go with. Yeah. Uh, so you can hit the wrench. Story. Yeah. All right. New story. Uh, try Simon. Simon's awesome. So, what this game is a social simulation about the okay. lives. Exactly. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Zach. Zach would be great. So, this is a game about playing the story of these 18 high school characters on the week before their prom. Each one of these stories. Is the center around the character. This is Zach's story. Zach has some goals he wants to to achieve before his prom. Like, like he wants to get rid of his bully. Actually, if you click on Zach's goals in the top left, you'll see. So he wants to, to sweet talk the judge. So he wants to have get friends with be friends with Naomi, who is the prom queen judge, <coughs> who's the the, the prom queen. So she can vote him in the prom game. He wants to get his dream date for the prom. Things like this. Uh, but what's novel here um, is the openness of the simulation, the things you can do. There are many, many verbs that every character can do with every other character. It's up to you in sort of a sims like way to navigate this space to help the characters achieve their goals or how, how they spectacularly fail at their goals.
Uh, so unlike uh, a lot, unlike The Sims, or unlike uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of like the uh, the dating games, sort of the, the Japanese dating games that are dating sims that are, that are so much fun. Uh, this game actually caches out, with respect to The Sims, it actually caches out like real dialogue and round interactions that can involve multiple characters, like cheating. Uh, in The Sims 3, you couldn't, you couldn't capture this level of cheating because you only had pairwise interactions with the characters. Cheating is naturally a three character thing, right? I date you, you date someone else, therefore you are cheating on me, I'm cheated on by you, there's a home record, there's, that, there's all sorts of labels that are associated with this that make it like a rich space to play. Uh, and we need to catch up rich, riches in a round way. Uh, this game allows for that while allowing for like natural language generation. So they're actually like, speaking real text that's actually generated specifically for that particular situation, for the relationship between these characters. Uh, so this uh, is different from the well-crafted uh, dating sims because they are basically dialogue trees. You're navigating a big branching tree. Uh, sometimes you can loop back to other places. You uh, you change your relationship in very hard ways. Sometimes there are some features in fact. Uh, also closely related are modern role-playing games, right? Like Mass Effect 3. You have dialogue trees. You, you talk to characters and you have one of three options to take. And if you pick the right one, you know, maybe you'll get some light side points if you're playing uh, or dark side points. Uh, so basically like this one level, one scalar uh, uh, like state of your deep interaction with the world. So here we have a lot more state. This this is way over. Uh, it's more sandbox. So you have a lot of verbs you can do. You have a lot of corners you can drive characters' relationships into. Uh, so this, by the fact that this is more deeply playable, by the fact that there are uh, more open things to do, more ways to play with the world, by playing the world, uh, you learn about this. You learn about how this world, this culture, is encoded between these characters. Uh, kind of like playing SimCity, right? So SimCity, open simulation, place buildings here, you're not very good at it at first, your, your commercial cities don't grow, you don't get a high population, you don't know how these pieces interact with one another. You have to play, and through play, you learn sort of like the stylized model of city planning. So this is a very similar affair. Well, I guess affair may be an interesting term to use. Um, yeah, the, the characters have interactions in this more open space, and you get to play with you get to see how bad the bad ramifications of cheating or, or bullying uh, have in this particular like culture, this particular slice of the game. So that is the persuasive bit here. So what, what we're doing here is illuminating an issue in the player's mind, illuminating a space, letting them know what's going on inside of these characters' minds, inside of this, what are the issues here? What's good, what's bad, how do people react? Uh, and you can, this is, uh, you can see this being uh, true for for more permanent things, like uh, for another project that's closer related, related to this, uh, a darker project where uh, it's a it's a good stranger uh, simulator for training, uh, you know, well anyone, peacekeeping officers, uh, you know, U.S. troops, uh, how to interact with other cultures uh, in a way that doesn't break that interaction. Basically, they they be good strangers. What you think like a good person should do out in the wild. Uh, and, you know, when we take our, you know, 17 to 23-year-old, uh, uh, you know, trained uh, military people who are very, very capable of doing their jobs, uh, they, they may not be as capable of, you know, being nice to someone. Maybe that's not something they learn through the course of their life. Well, we have a persuasive game, a training simulation, fully 3D embodied, where in the world you have your kid on and everything, uh, where you learn how to do more civil interactions. You learn how to... You learn that you need to say please, you need to say thank you, you need to have it for appropriate distance. You know that you need to not stare at the person's children when you're interacting with them. Things like this. Very, very, uh, very soft social cues. Things that you couldn't, that, that aren't typically part of this. So that's the persuasive point of persuading someone that they actually need to be respected. Uh, so that's one aspect of what we do is sort of this deep model uh, simulation learning through. So this game did, uh, did pretty well from week. At IGF 2012, 
if you want to check it out, problemgame.com. Obviously, I'm a fan. Uh, so, Chris, did you have any of uh, Lindsay's work? So, we, yeah, here's uh, an interesting. I guess you're almost to the end of the film, aren't you? Well, <laughs> you know. So, here's a game that <clears throat> was put together by uh, the head of the AU Game Lab. Um, if it looks a little unfamiliar, uh, that's because it is a really out of the box uh, video game where you control it with a real world component, and that's part of the persuasion. It's an endless runner where you're a teddy bear and you control the teddy bear's jumping by hugging a real teddy bear. And the goal of this game is to teach affection. Um, if you give the bear too much affection, it starts to like flip out on the screen and it'll be really hard to control. So the, the goal is to teach people, you know, to give affection but in appropriate amounts so that you know it's not uncomfortable for the you know person receiving the affection. So, yeah, not only do, when we do persuasive games, again, we, we deal with, um, here's a, a game that ha is very familiar to a lot of people, is this sort of endless runner, this sort of um, cannibal, Rayman jungle run, temple run kind of thing, but engaged in a new and interesting way, with, you know, an interesting twist on it, uh, where you know, by interacting with it, you're actually exploring some concept that is, you know, outside of the actual game itself. So here again, uh, we have this idea of an affection game, a game about, um, you know, instead of uh, violent behavior, you know, positive behavior, things like that. So instead of slamming a button, you're hugging a teddy bear. Yeah, it's a totally different, like different mode of interaction put you in different mindsets. Uh, here's another really interesting game called uh, You, A Very Meaningful Game. And you, it's a very simple platformer. You're just the word you, and you have to figure out where you fit in. You know, and even think about that, that statement. You know, think about where you fit in. That's kind of interesting because it's, it's almost, it's a you know, very motivational game. Um, you know, you, and it's interesting that you have to figure out what are the good words and what are the bad words and things like that. Um, so, like, jumping to conclusions, as you just saw, you know, makes you fail and puts you at, at sort of the beginning of this level. And then you can look at, this is a game that involves you. Okay, so now you've reached a good point. So, these are the kind of puzzles that gamers love to solve, but they may not necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's sort of mixed together in a new way. You know, and then here you have you and I interacting. So you see there's the message there is, uh, you and I have to work together to solve the puzzle. Even describing the puzzles becomes an exercise in, in persuasion. <clears throat> Should take that in for a department trailer. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so you know, those are that's a, a taste of some of the games that that um, you know sometimes you can do really inventive things to create persuasion, and then that, that creates a novelty to this game because you know you tell somebody that they're going to play a game, an educational game, a persuasive game, sometimes they kind of put it in this little box that's sort of off to the side, not necessarily part of real games. Um, but then if you really make them seem like real games, kind of, which was, you know, the purpose with Function Force 4, which is the purpose with games like Prom Week, uh, or you give them some interesting novelty, then people are more likely to approach them because they just happen to be interesting games. Uh, one game that I recently created, um, using the language of games that are very familiar. I created a game called Ice Bucket Challenge. I was uh, challenged to the Ice Bucket Challenge as many people were over the summer. And instead of making a uh, video, I decided to make a video game. I also donate the money. 
But the rhetoric here is one of, um, you know, so many, the, the criticism about the Ice Bucket Challenge was that people were using it mostly as social media stunts rather than actually engaging, like, the charity, which was the point. Um, now, eventually, it became, you know, people start, started doing the video and also donating. Um, but the goal here, the rhetoric here is, you know, ice buckets are bad, they will stop you from donating, so you should try to collect the coins, build up a donation, and then the goal of the game, like the goal of the level here, and it's only one level, um, it's a short game, but the goal of the level is your mailbox. So the idea being that you have to collect the coins to build your donation and then get to your mailbox. Um, so, you know, what game does this very closely resemble. Mega Man. Mega Man, exactly. So, you know, the goal of persuasive games, um, you know, when I do persuasive games, I really try to, and you know, as evidenced by, um, you know, some of the other games we worked on, I really try to capture, okay, what is going to bring people in? What's going to make people think, hey, this looks like a fun game? So if you notice, um, there's other things thrown into the mix. It wasn't just ice buckets, because quite frankly, you can really only uh, milk that sort of like bad stuff drops down in intervals mechanics so much before it becomes uninteresting. If I'm going to make some challenging level that gamers are going to want to play, I want to treat it like a good game level. So uh, I added lava and then to the ice buckets. And then I also added these uh, buttons with legends. Now, I'm using the same type of stuff that I would use if I was designing a commercial entertainment game, uh, which is you know, level design, introduce mechanics one at a time. Here we're introducing this button, you know, switch between the blue and the red uh, here. So it's introduced in an easy way so you understand it. Okay, so the players absorb this. Now they can go collect more stuff. Okay, look at this screen. It introduces that the lava and the water interact with each other and that when you have the water cool down the lava, it's safe. Because we landed, and this is you know, classic level design stuff. You land on cool lava, and that communicates to the player that this is safe. This if I just had grass here, and then you saw this turn black, you may not know that it's safe or cool. You know, you might assume, based on the fact that you can't go forward anymore without it, but this just kind of clinches it. Okay, so we have this idea. Now, now we can use the water, you know, we can use the ice buckets to help us. Um, but it still provides an, a challenging puzzle element. Okay, now let's make the buttons meet up. Again, these are the sorts of relationships that play out in a lot of video games. And, you know, the, the trick is that, you know, you create this fun, interesting video game, and oh, by the way, donate to ALS at, or ALS, ALS. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, uh, persuasive games can take a lot of different forms and they don't all have to be, you know, sort of outside the realm of typical video games. Um, another thing that I, I added to this was, there's no lives, I originally thought about it, uh, you know, being really old school and having you have like three lives or something like that. But then in the end, it, it's like, you know, I, Again, you, you decide what language of games to use and what not to when you have these persuasive conversations. Um, and games, you know, think about games as conversations. So, is dying important? Is failure important? Well, I would argue no, because if you have something, you know, have somebody fail and get frustrated at the game and have to start over, then that kind of diminishes the, the goal of the game, which is to create a positive impact. So. It's fun to challenge, it's fun to see and feel what an obstacle these ice buckets are, but you know, you don't have to, it, uh, you're not doing so in a way that's really going to make people uh, hate playing your game. And in fact, I actually, uh, you know, a friend of mine shared this with people uh, on Facebook, and somebody responded to his Facebook thread about this by saying that she had played this game, or she had tried, 41 times before she got to the end. You know, so the idea is that it is an addictive game, and it was made to be an addictive, interesting game, but it also ha carries a message with it. 
So even when you do have games that can have a message, you don't have to make it something that's, you know, gamers are afraid to approach. And for every point you collect, Chris donates a dollar. No. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, that's why I also put in the, the challenge attempts because that way it, it gives you that sort of like pat on the back, well I'm going to try it next time and get more coins and, and die less. Or maybe dying becomes part of your strategy and you use that to refresh the coins. You know, there's lots of things you can do with this. Um, and again, that's using the, the, using the ingredients of good game design to create something that has a, has a purpose, a real life purpose. Um, I guess the other thing we should talk about very briefly and then open it up to questions is uh, what, or do you think that there are any games, uh, are there any games that you think of that are made initially as entertainment games, but that eventually became educational or persuasive? Uh, well, the, the classic one that we just talked about was SimCity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was totally made to be... Uh, to be a fun game to play, and just happened to, to be educational about city planning. Yeah. And how to fight off Godzilla and, uh, and Bowser. And Bowser, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, that's really interesting because that's a lot of what inspires Will Wright's designs is, you know, uh, wanting to play with a city simulation system. Or The Sims was created after he read Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander, which is this architecture book um, about, you know, pleasant. Uh, patterns in real world spaces. You know, he wanted a game where you could play with that, and then the the little Sims were sort of your victory leader, if you will. Um, one we discussed last night was Civilization. Yeah, um, because you know, you ask them at, at Firaxis, and they're like, no, it really isn't meant to be educational. But how can it not be? You know, Civilization. You you um, same thing with a game like uh, I talked about the. Or game diplomacy a lot. You know, I feel like I always tell people like I know exactly, or I know some element of how it felt to be in pre World War One European politics because I played this game where I almost got into fights with my friends. Um, for those who don't know, diplomacy is a board game that's basically risk without dice. It's fantastic. Um, so you engage with these systems and learn something through this entertainment. A uh, classic example that was meant to be educational but ended up being. You know, like, what kid from the night that grew up in the '90s, '80s, and '90s doesn't know uh, how much dysentery like pioneers <laughs> have to deal with? You um, remember lose eight bullets at auction, and you broke the wheel, right? <laughs> you know, and I, I was watching this uh, this mini series a couple of years ago, like Into the West or something like that. They they had a scene where a wagon train tried to ford the river. I'm like. <laughs> and they failed miserably. I'm like, I don't remember failing that much. Maybe I was playing it on easy mode, but I always felt like Fording the River was like, let's do it! Um, so maybe the game didn't quite have it right. <laughs> but yeah, they, they lost like a person, three oxen, and some bullets uh, in that show. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I wanted to round the box out a little bit on that. Okay. And that games that were meant just to be games that ended up being educational. Uh, I'd like to say that. Some of them were meant to be experiences, the experience would actually be educational, like Dysphoria yeah. by um, you know, Entropy. Uh, while it's meant to sort of like express her uh, transition through gender, her, her, uh, her, her story, uh, it actually teaches you a, a good deal about what that situation is like. And then poker, right? Uh, poker teaches you statistics like crazy. Oh, you just write that. That's uh, an advantage of it. Like, also, StarCraft. You learn rates of flow. Uh, you learn, uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of rate of flow, a lot of positioning. There's, there's, well, there's still, there's like a, some mathematic education when I'm a lot of these complicated things. Oh yeah, like, you know, a kid playing Pokemon knows a lot about, like any Japanese role-playing game, you mm -hmm. know, knows how to budget their money, they know math, they know, they, they get to work on their reading skills, they get to figure out, you know, maybe probability of, of how much damage, you know, one type of Pokemon is going to do against another, things like that. Um, so I guess let's open it up to questions. Uh, what do you guys have to say about these persuasive games? Uh, is there anything you want to know? Anything you're confused by? Anything you're like, you disagree with us and you don't think games can be persuasive? Go for it. Okay, the pressure's on. 
<laughs> it seems like persuasive play can have the biggest, broadest sort of impact when it is more kind of subversively woven into games with more traditional mechanics or a traditional sort of setup, as opposed to some of the other ones we looked at where the specific idea from the beginning is to persuade someone to do something. I don't know, I, I, yeah. I feel like it has, the big, it has the biggest impact in society if it's woven in to kind of the existing fabric of games. So as somebody who teaches game development, this is something that I really enjoy engaging because, um, so at a place, I, at a school I used to teach at, um, we had a, a mobile game development course and we would do persuasive games for clients. And they would uh, come to us with a real world problem they wanted to solve, they wanted to solve through a game. Um, and what was really helpful with this is that that was the <coughs> student's first real big game project. So they got to, ex you know, suddenly they were not just in school to recreate their like favorite JRPG, you know, or, or FPS. They were suddenly in school, like solving a real world problem. So they had more interesting design problems to deal with. We made a game for people on probation, and a lot of them were violent offenders. So, you know, you had to say, well, this game can't have any violence in it. And suddenly they're like, well, how do you have conflict and obstacles without enemies to fight? And I mean, a lot of us are thinking, like, do you remember pits? Like, what's wrong with you? Um, but that was a thing that took a little bit of mental reconfiguring to get them to solve. And by the end of these semesters, they were, you know, breaking down really complex real world problems into game mechanic systems. And then suddenly, you know, you have their next class, you know, they're taking a, a regular game development course. Not only do they know scope better, <laughs> but they're suddenly like weaving these more intricate systems of, well, our game is about working in a kitchen and it's gonna be like this sort of funny WarioWare meets Cooking Mama thing. So here's the mechanics of cooking in, you know, on this device. Like, what does it mean to have it on this device versus that device? They're starting to break down what it means to have a game on specific things and not just recreating stuff they knew. So um, it makes better designers to engage in this kind of stuff, even. It's really more round, holistic thinking about what your game and about the mechanics. Yes. Yeah. Makes for fun games. Yep. Anybody else? You? All right, here's the thought. Okay. Um, so, you know, the things that go into designing games, you know, you have language game design, and we've got that part down pretty well, and you know, we know how to make certain things persuasive. But how does the methods of distribution and dissemination come into play here? So, like, who sees the ice bucket challenge besides, you know, Chris's Twitter feed, or, like, if it goes viral? Where yeah. is that, that middle ground as to who's going to be engaging with these things? That's a good point. So um, getting these out there noted and playable is is, uh, is, is a challenge. Uh, so making a game that is a good game is a great first step, right? Because then you put it on Steam and get it greenlit. Then you could uh, have some other distribution net that you know, do some other distribution channel like Xbox Live or uh, you know, something on, on Uya. You know, it, if it's a good game, people will download it and play it, and it'll, it'll be disseminated more rapidly. There's also, if there are games about issues, there are uh, media sources that cover those issues that can uh, release the game along with articles, things like that. Uh, you know, traditional media is is our friend in, in this case. Yeah. And, and I think it goes along with the idea of what becomes the purpose of releasing the game. So for example, Function Force 4. Uh, it's something that we could totally, at the end, put on Steam or you know, Xbox Live Arcade, put on the App Store, things like that. But, you know, at the same time, you want to distribute it to targeted groups like, hey, teachers, this is out here, put it in your classrooms if you're teaching, you know, the quadratic formula. Um, and that can help, you know, our, did, okay, here's a question, people who had played Yorgon Trail, did you play it in school or at home? 
eventually I never played Yeah, eventually, <laughs> but yeah, you, you probably saw it on like a computer lab in your school, yeah. right? Yeah, so, you know, there's that kind of targeted thing for an educational game for things like this. Ice Bucket Challenge, it's one of those things where, you know, again, yeah, you disseminate it across your Twitter feed. Um, you can send it to, uh, I do need to still send it to AL, ALSA, <laughs> um, but I wanted to do a couple polishes on it. But yeah, you know, the you can send it to these targeted groups, um, you know, so yeah, just releasing it into the wild if you are creating it for a specific purpose, um, it, it largely depends. Uh, but I mean, as any indie developer knows, like just kind of setting it out there in the wild is, is risky as it is because there's such a huge market there. Yeah, game was users are for everybody. It's luck and networking. <laughs> yeah, luck and networking. Or large bunch of factors that you really should be. When designing something like Ice Bucket Challenge or maybe something much more complex, how do you uh, figure out, or how do you make sure that the joke is not lost on people, or the commentary or the lesson, I guess, in a persuasive type game is not lost on the audience? So that's really tough, um, and you almost can't in a lot of ways, and again, that's one of those things that, that there's a lot of research into, it's a big question. Um, a good example is the game Facade, or Experience. Uh, interactive drama. Interactive drama, yes. The interactive drama facade where... Um, oh, the dude and his wife? Yes. Oh, that's... <laughs> See, okay, that's... So this is the funny part about these is, you know, so for those who don't know, facade is an interactive drama where you are going to your your college friend's or Mary's apartment for a dinner party and you walk in and they are essentially in the middle of a fight. So you choose to interact with things in a certain way and those can have ramifications on how they interact with each other and you. So what happens is, this was discovered um, by some YouTubers, and it turned into like, you know, I made her put a wine bottle on her head. You know. <laughs> and, and in a way, that's the that, you know that the tone kind of implies that that's like you know a bad thing. But the the thing with interactive media is that the user user does have agency to interact with it the way they wish, and those are meaningful, so it might be lost on people, but at the same time, that's kind of the risk you take when you make it in game form, as, as opposed to like, I'm going to make a short film about this topic, and it's going to very clearly state what I think. Um, games are open, and, you know, hey, if people are playing it and distributing it, then to me, that's the better part. Uh, really, you know, if somebody, plays the Ice Bucket Challenge and thinks that I'm, there's like secret, if you play the music backwards, it, it tells you to you know, like, <laughs> Yeah, subliminally persuasive. Yeah, like, you know, um, you know, like, you know, big fanny pack introduction uh, spiked because of Ice Bucket Challenge game. What? Um, you know, hey, all right, so be it. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, that's a problem that is really tough to track. And in a way, all games deal with that. You know, Richard Garriott is really famous for, I'm like, I'm gonna give you the ability to do everything. You know, and he gets a bunch of letters like, everybody's being a jerk. And he's like, why is everybody being a jerk? I'm gonna make Ultimate Four where you have to be good, you know? Exactly. Yeah, so um, it, it happens in all games. You know, persuasive or entertainment. Play testing. Playtesting. <laughs> Alan playtesting. Get your coming from I think what's specific for facade though is um, when people initially play it, uh, there isn't a clarity of what you can do, what affects the game, and how to get positive and negative reactions. Because there's there's so many playthroughs where you can be saying like, hello, how are you? Be perfectly cordial, and you get kicked out anyways, and you don't really have an effect as if you did nothing and said nothing, or yeah. if you did something else, so. Yeah, well, so when you introduce a complex system like this, so what side was like blow open the world, what you could do inside of a virtual world, right? You could interact with natural language and say almost anything. It had a big recognition. 
you could you have a lot of physical curves you could do in the world, like actually where you're stupid matter. Uh, so there's you know this like big space and like it's really hard to make that space viable for all possible inputs. And and the thing is too is it goes back into what game system are you using? Facade is is not like things people have seen before. So they're going to go into it. They're going to like kind of poke at it and figure out what happens, and then that's when you get sort of the funny reactions to it. And that's what makes it, you know, more spreadable because it is this weird thing. You know, it's it's like the penny arcade comic when game plays Minecraft for the first time and punches a tree and then some wood falls out and he's like, oh my god, you know. And then like the next night he's built you know super structures, um, and has like become obsessed with it. That's, that's kind of how those really open-ended games work. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, it may lose the message or the purpose of the game, but at the same time, the interaction is kind of the wonderful thing about games. Um, you know, Ice Bucket Challenge, on the other hand, is a platformer. It looks like Mega Man. It uses the language of Mega Man. It's, it's designed to have people be like, I know this. I know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, and... Look at all those expectations. Yeah, like, yeah. exactly. Oh, gosh. Like, yeah. Know. And, oh, and I, gotta, I gotta get those. Exactly. So it's, it's, it d goes into the language you choose to have as the designer. It's like, I chose, I'm like, I'm gonna do a retro game, and people are gonna be like, I get this. Oh, and, and yeah, donate. Cool. Um, so that's kind of how you mold, um, how you mold, or choose to mold your design. You can either do it in this very experimental, open-ended way, or you can say, okay, we're going to do something that, that is very familiar. And, I mean, both are, they're almost like tactics. It's like the tactics of how you choose to, to interact with your audience. But for most messages, you would need to have, like, some clear way of the player being able to understand what actions have what consequences and how to influence the world. Yeah, yeah. actually, a very concrete scenario or issue to work with. Yeah, <laughs> that's a uh, design constraints help. Well, and, and then and that goes into the goal of the persuasive design because some are open ended in that it's not trying to tell you A or B. It's just trying to let you explore the system. Um, you know, JFK Reloaded is like that. There's this persuasive or this news game JFK Reloaded where you just, you just shoot JFK. You know. And, and the goal of the game, it's not to shoot JFK or that JFK was bad or anything. It's, it's that you're trying to recreate the shit. Like, after every time you take the shot, it tells you how close you were to the forensic evidence that's out there. Or how close you are to recreating the wounds where they were on the people that they were on. And it's... Its goal is just that you explore the system, you know, and of course people are going to get into like, oh, I'm shooting JFK, um, and that's what caused a lot of backlash against it, but the goal is, you know, people who are like, oh, this is interesting to, f you know, people are going to think about what it means to take that shot and what it means to recreate that evidence. It's actually very hard in that game to make it happen, like almost near impossible. But, you know, it's, it's an explore, uh, exploratory game. It's like Super Columbine RPG, Super yep. Columbine Massacre RPG. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, again, a, a game system, you can sort of open-ended explore it, but it, it, you know, it can make you think about the system if you're the type of player who is going to thoughtfully think about the game system. But even then, like the, the I guess, shooting JFK, even if it's open-ended and I can do so many things to affect the shot. I clearly understand uh, how I can affect the shot. Whereas oh, yeah. in some of these, if you add too many mechanics, it kind of becomes jumbled exactly what I can do to affect what. And, and that, that's the danger of any really open-ended system because, you know, first time you play Minecraft, you're probably playing it where the zombies come out at night and you want to avoid them. So there's, there's, this is called shaping. You know, it's the same thing as if you learn how to swing a golf club. You know, you'll learn how to hold it first, then you'll learn how to stand, then you'll learn how to swing it. And you take, you just sort of stack 
um, you sort of stack like skills, basically. Um, and that's how Minecraft teaches you. It, it kind of gives you a little bit, and you master that little bit, and then by the end, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, now I'm making NES friends um, at skyscraper level. So, you know, there's, there's these ways of shaping how people understand the game. Something like facade just kind of throws you in there. So this is actually a rhetorical point, right? Yes. So you can make a statement about throwing the player into a space where yeah. the space is very hard to deal with, very muddled, very confusing, and you don't know what effects you have. That is a point. Like if you had a game about, let's say, affecting the US national economy by changing tax rates. Who knows if changing, you know, giving someone a ten thousand dollar rebate would actually affect the overall economy. Right? So you could actually make a game where every action you do doesn't have like any appreciable effect. And you could make a political statement. Yep. Yeah, and and really, um, I mean that's the kind of interesting thing about the confusing nature of facade when you kind of walk into it is that you're kind of, I mean really have you ever walked in on two friends having a having a like horrible fight you're kind of, it's kind of weird and uncomfortable and that's that's a way in a way that's part of the rhetoric of that or a storytelling element of facade because if you know you went in there and suddenly a little thing popped up saying to tick him off you know, to flirt with her and tick him off, type of this, you know. And that would kind of break the whole, it would teach you how to play the game better, but it would totally break the immersion element of just being like, what the just want to do this. studies on this particular topic. Yeah. yeah. The facade changing it into a, uh, into a sort of like Mass Effect 3 style radio menu, choose your next option type of game, uh, for so open ended. And I believe people at the end of the day had higher, uh, had higher, uh, uh, what is the term, uh, higher empathy with the game, and actually preferred the open-ended uh, natural language of building. And empathy is a really big element of persuasive games, too, like uh, that dragon cancer. No, oh, jeez, I'm going to cry now. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, like some games are about, some persuasive games are about, uh, and these are the very linear ones that are like, this is how you play this game. Those are the ones where um, it's really important to experience something through game mechanics, and then suddenly you you get the you're, you get a small taste of the experience. So like that, Dysphoria is really good for that. Dysphoria is great. Like everybody should go play this game. It's like WarioWare about you know gender uh, treatment, about gender <laughs> identity issues. Yeah, gender identity yeah. issues and uh, you know, uh, hormone transition. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. You know, they do this thing, but yeah, like some of them, the point is that you can't win again. And then once you realize that, you, or once you've been given enough time that you can't win, you like swap to the next mechanic. It's really cool. But, you know, that's a great illustration of how you form a game based on these experiences by just making these interesting statements. It takes like, WarioWare is just the best way I can describe it. It's not even quite like WarioWare. Um, but a very simple mini game. Yeah, but it's shaped, you know, in that way. And, you know, it, that makes it really interesting because it, it transcends what normal games are. Um, but it's not so, you know, big and, and intelligible that, you know, it's hard to figure out what to do. All right, so we're five minutes over. Thanks for staying. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks for staying. Thank you.